Lieutenant General Robert Wagner, the deputy commander of GIFCOM, has likewise said that, quote, relative to interrogation capability, the expertise of JPRA lies in training personnel how to respond and resist interrogations, not in how to conduct interrogations. Requests for JIPRA interrogation support were both inconsistent with the unit's charter and might create conditions which tasked JPRA to engage in offensive operational activities outside of JPRA's defensive mission. The Department of Defense's Inspector General's report, completed in August of 06, said that the techniques in Iraq and Afghanistan had derived in part from JPRA and SEER. Many have questioned why we should care about the rights of detainees. On May 10, 2007, General David Petraeus answered that question in a letter to his troops. And this is what General Petraeus wrote. Our values and the laws governing warfare teach us to respect human dignity, maintain our integrity, and do what is right. Adherence to our values distinguishes us from our enemy. This fight depends on securing the population, which must understand that we, not our enemies, occupy the moral high ground. And he continued, I fully appreciate the emotions that one experiences in Iraq. I also know firsthand the bonds between members of the Brotherhood of the Close Fight. Seeing a fellow trooper killed by a barbaric enemy can spark frustration, anger, and a desire for immediate revenge. As hard as it might be, however, we must not let these emotions lead us or our comrades in arms to commit hasty, illegal actions. In the event that we witness or hear of such actions, we must not let our bonds prevent us from speaking up. Some might argue that we would be more effective if we sanctioned torture or other expedient methods to obtain information from the enemy. They would be wrong. Beyond the basic fact that such actions are illegal, history shows that they are also frequently neither useful nor necessary. And he concluded, we are indeed warriors. We train to kill our enemies. We are engaged in combat. We must pursue the enemy relentlessly, and we must be violent at times. What sets us apart from our enemies in this fight, however, is how we behave. In everything we do, we must observe the standards and values that dictate that we treat non-combatants and detainees with dignity and respect. While we are warriors, we are also all human beings. Senator Warner has asked Senator Graham to be the uh, acting ranking member today, I believe, and so I would call That's correct, Senator Mr. Graham. Chairman. Uh, Senator Graham is a full colonel in the JAG Corps of the United States Military Reserve. Uh, I collaborated with him and Senator McCain when we did the Detainee Treatment Act, and uh, I've asked, and Senator McCain joined in this, that he uh, represent our side as the ranking here this morning and throughout the context of these hearings. I would like to say, Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, we've got to look at this situation in the context of the aftermath of 9-11, when this country was struggling to come to a full recognition about our vulnerability to attacks such as we experienced on that fateful day. And I think men and women uh, in uniform as well as in the civilian community did everything we could to try and preserve and protect our great nation, a nation it is founded under the rule of law. Thank you. And there shall be no deviation from that. I also, uh, Mr. Chairman, draw your attention to the letter that <coughs> you received in the committee from the counsel for <coughs> one of the witnesses today. And in your reply, you said, on those rare occasions when a witness believed that he or she should not answer a question without divulging classified information, the witness has so informed the committee. Uh, could the chair advise the committee how we will uh, uh, avail ourselves of such classified information that the witnesses may possess at the same time protecting them? Well, of course, we uh, have, uh, would uh, request, if it's appropriate, that information be declassified, but we cannot receive classified information at this hearing. Absolutely. <clears throat> I see. 
Well, let's also reflect on the fact that in April 2004 through 2006, this committee, recognizing there were problems in this area, conducted 17 hearings and briefings with regard to military, to detainee abuse, military commissions, and the new Army field manual. That was largely out of the Alba grave. You and I worked together on that, Mr. Chairman, and that led to the Detainee Treatment Act. So I think this committee has a long record, of both under Republican control and Democrat control, to examine this matter. It is an important tradition, and I'm glad that uh, you made reference to it, that this committee conduct this kind of oversight hearing. And uh, it is our responsibility, um, and I, I am grateful for your reference to uh, that effort on our part. Senator Graham. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to the witnesses for testifying before us today. Uh, let me, get, me begin by saying I have made it clear uh, a long time ago that I believe that administration lawyers use bizarre legal theories to justify harsh interrogation techniques. I've also been troubled by the fact that they implemented these procedures over the strenuous objections of military lawyers and many others with expertise in uh, in these areas. I think our military community, particularly our legal community, Mr. Chairman, has been saying, what about the shoe on the other foot? I don't doubt for one moment what Al-Qaeda will do to anyone they capture wearing our uniform. That's not the issue. We know what they do. As a matter of fact, I saw a video last night of a Taliban um, group showing a 14-year-old about to slit the throat of one of their captives. Obviously, the video did not go to conclusion, but that is a bit about who we're fighting. And the question is, how do we beat these people? Do we behave like them, or do we behave differently? Do we marginalize them, or do we empower them? And I would argue that any time that we can be associated with techniques that go down their road, we're empowering them and marginalizing ourselves. In this regard, what we're trying to do here today is important. Now, the guidance that was provided during this period of time, I think will go down in history as some of the most irresponsible and short-sighted legal analysis ever provided to our nation's military and intelligence communities. I do not believe the members of the administration who played a major role in developing interrogation policies were motivated by anything other than a desire to protect our nation. I know that to be true, that the men and women in question felt America was under attack, and we were, and they were motivated uh, to protect the nation. That to me is clear. And in that regard, their service is to be appreciated. However, if the administration adhered to the letter and spirit of the law, our treaty obligations, and adequately consulted with Congress, I do not believe we would be here today. It is important that we all understand and agree that the high ground in this war against Islamic extremism is the moral high ground. The high ground is often a military term used where the advantage to those occupying the high ground is clear and those below uh, are in a very precarious situation. In this war, there is no capital to conquer, no air force to shoot down, no navy to seek. The high ground in this war against radical Islamic extremism is the moral high ground. We're not going to conquer this enemy on a battlefield. There will be no surrender with a white flag. It is truly a battle of ideas and values. And the issues we're going to discuss today represent a lost opportunity in this war. I'd like to briefly outline where we were in the aftermath of the tragic events of September 11th and where we are today in terms of the interrogation detention and trial of enemy combatants for war crimes. Let's face the cold hard facts. On September the 10th, 2001, America was unprepared. We were not ready to fight an enemy that claimed no country and wore no uniform. We weren't ready to capture, detain, and interrogate terrorist suspects who represent no nation state and indiscriminately kill civilians and soldiers alike. After we invaded Iraq, we underestimated the threat of an insurgency and were slow to adapt to the situation on the ground. 